Okay, so yes, if you check your Canvas inbox, again, I'm not going to click it because I don't want to show everyone's stuff, but you should see your report. Now, it'll have two reports on there, actually. It'll have one for the 314 class, and then it will have one for the 1414 class. And just like I told you guys at the end of the semester, if your 1414 grade was higher than your 314 grade, that I would use the 1443, right? So you might see on that report your 13 or 314 score, and then you might see it crossed out in a little comment that says, I'm going to use your 1443. And that's because your 1414 grade was higher. Okay. And so when I entered the midterms, I entered your 1414 grade as it was, and then the 314 grade, depending on whether your 1414 grade was higher. Okay. And so those have been submitted. Now, they don't really mean anything too much. Um, I do have to submit them. They are supposed to give people an idea of how they're doing at this point in time. But this is really the point of not no return yet. We're still not there yet, okay? But this is the point where you have to reflect, okay? So you have to decide, has what I've been doing been working right and I have the grade that I'm wanting or do I need to work a little bit extra to get the grade that I want or am I way off and I just need to completely reroute all of my study habits and things like that right um because it is still very much possible to finish the rest of the course and you can, you can either go one of three ways your grade can either maintain what it is your grade can improve significantly like significantly from an F to an A still happen okay or it can decrease significantly, right? From an A to an F, you don't do nothing else, right? So it's really not a determining factor of how everything's gonna end. See what I mean? That's why I mean like the score's not that important because it really doesn't tell me how things are gonna end up. And I have seen drastic changes before where my A students turned into F students, my F students turned into A students. It all depends on how the second half goes, okay? Usually what happens is the students just do whatever they're gonna do that first half. And then once that second half goes, now you know what you gotta do, right? For the rest of the semester, okay? So I had to enter it just cause it's a requirement on my part, but um, don't worry, you can still go in there and make some stuff happen. So this is gonna be the last test over the 314 stuff. So once we grade this test, I will have your 314 grade but keep in mind, once we eventually get out of all of the 1414 14 stuff and we take that 1414 14 final exam, once I figure out what your final 1414 14 grade is, I will compare the two scores and always keep the higher one. Okay. So 314, it is what it is, but if your 1414 14 is better, it will just get replaced. Okay. That doesn't mean because I have a lot of students, especially the online students who are just not doing anything with 314. They're not doing the homework and they're not even taking the 314 test, okay? That's, I get it, I get the strategy that's happening there. You're like, oh, well, you're gonna replace 314 later anyway, so I don't need to focus my attention on it. However, all of those skills that we've been learning in the 314 material are going to be employed in the 1414 material, okay? So they are still, quote unquote, important in their own way, right? Maybe not for your scores, but for the information that is important, okay? So that's why I did mention to you guys, I have opened up all of the old homeworks. Once this test comes, um, I will reopen everything all over again, right? Because I think I have it due on the 20th at midnight or something like that. So yes, it's going to shut off, but then I'm going to reopen everything, okay? And then I'll just put all the new due dates whenever the next unit is due. Does that make sense? As I don't, I want you to do the work before you take the test, because that's how you can get a better test score, right? Is if you practice all the material before you take the test, then you're good. Doing all the homework after you've taken the test doesn't do as much good. Yes, it's still preparing you for 14, 14 but now you still have an ugly score, right? So just try to balance all of that out. And also super important, if you are going to go do old homework, don't do it at the expense of not keeping up with the current homework, okay? 
current homework is the focus. So whatever unit we're currently on, that's the one you need to concentrate on. And then if you have time, go to the old stuff and start beating those scores up. Okay. Even if you had a zero, you could still go in there and do it. Okay. If you had a 70 and you want to make it a hundred, you can go in there and you do it. Okay. Okay, so there are 20 questions on this review. There are only 10 on the actual test. Okay, so we're going to go through these 20 and some of them you'll notice are the same kind of problem, but of course the polynomials or the functions are different, right? So I'm going to go ahead and open up my camera and then I can write down this first problem. We can start going through them. Now for this test, I do want to make you guys aware that there is no formula sheet. I went through the test and I took it and there's really no formulas that we need to remember at this point. Okay. It's mostly processes. Um, and those processes you need to know, like they can't be just like going and looking at the information. Okay. You've got to know them by now. And I think you'll do. So we'll see. Let me see math. 14, so we're doing 3, 14. 0, 3, 1, 4. And if you're looking at the board, you're seeing all of those numbers on the board. That was just me discussing the, uh, the course sequence after this class. So after this class, you take the pre-cal, then the cal one, cal two, cal three. And if you are engineering, you might need also take the linear algebra and differential equations. But before you take these two, the last two, the linear algebra and the VE, um, make sure that whatever university you're transferring to accepts them. Because some of the institutions do and some of them don't accept these. And if they don't, just go take them over there at that university. Does that make sense? Okay. Normally, the university will take over if you still do. Okay. Always double check with your advisor or the other institution just to be sure before you go take it. Because otherwise, you're wasting your time and your money. You're going to have to go take it again later, right? Okay. okay. So, my problem that we have is this one. And the only directions that it says is to um, solve the inequality. Now, I'm going to give you a hint right now, okay? When I give you the directions on the test, not only does it say to solve, so if it says the word solve, that does not mean guess and check, okay? Or check all the solutions that are on the options, right? That's not what solving means, okay? So make sure that you solve. But I'm also gonna ask you for the key numbers. So make sure, not only does it say find them, but it also says identify them. So put it, key numbers, and then tell me what they are, okay? Once you have the key number, I need to know the test values too. Um, and then I need you to show your work when you test those values. Because I get a lot of people putting that number line and then just saying check X, check X, and that's it. Okay, so you have to show me. It's not on. <laughs> Thank you. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's put the screen on first. I haven't written much, so it's one of those where this is my Monday, I guess. <laughs> the first thing I do, I think that's why I kept going because <laughs> no, really that's the first button I push is to pull it out. Writer, it doesn't have my copy because it's like, is it visible? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Minus the little box on the way. Okay, cool. So that was number one. This x cubed minus 3x squared minus x plus 3 greater than zero. And so, yes, you do need to make sure that we solve it, right? Not just checking or guessing. Um, and then make sure I'm letting you know that in my directions, it literally says 
find and identify your key numbers and your test values. And it also says, be sure to show your work for your test values, okay? Because what I'm getting in the last couple of tests where we have been doing this process, uh, we did it with the quadratics, right? We did something like this, right? We did those. I'll get people putting this and then saying X, yes, X, and it's wrong. And I need to know why is it that you got that, right? How did you get this X check stuff, okay? So because if this is all I have and it's wrong, you get no points for that, right? That's not showing me your work. You'll get very minimal points for it, okay? However, if you are showing me your work and what you're getting, and I see that, oh, it's just a little tiny sign error down here, and that's why you made the wrong conclusion, okay? Then I can give you almost all the points back, except for one, for having an arithmetic error, right? So when I'm saying I'm making you do all this stuff, it's not to be mean. It's just to help you guys earn the most amount of points as possible, okay? I'm not trying to make it difficult. I'm trying to make it easier for you guys to get max out of those points, okay? So I'm definitely going to have to solve it. I'm going to always attempt the problems, like if the little um, choices were not there at all, and just pretend they're not there. The only reason that they're there um, is, one, to give you an idea of how your answer should look, and then for the online classes, it's literally so I know that they finished that problem while the test clock was running, right? Because once the test, once you submit it, if you didn't ever answer any of the questions on there, I don't know if what's on your paper was done during the test or if you did it afterward, right? So that's why I have it like that, it's for multiple choice. I just don't think it's fair to offer it multiple choice online and then not do it multiple choice face-to-face, -face, right? That's not, I need to keep on the equivalent. But always, always try them at the, the choices were not there. Okay, just ignore them until you're done with the problem. Okay, and also another reason why you want to ignore them is because I will have people that will check the answers and they know which one is the answer, and then they just start doing random things on their paper to get that answer. And I'm like, what is this? Why are you doing this? This does not make any sense. It has no relevance to the problem. You're just doing whatever you can do to get the answer by. And that's not okay, okay? You've got to know the process. Okay, so we're gonna do this one and we're gonna follow all of these little kind of tips to help me get the right answer and the max amount of my points. Now, anytime you see four terms, automatically, how are you supposed to factor that? Mm -hmm. By grouping. So then I'm gonna basically chop it off here in the middle for this minus sign. And what are the two sides here have these two terms have in common? Yes, x squared. <clears throat> so I have x minus 3. Now here you have no choice. You have to bring down that minus. If it was a plus, I would have to bring down the plus. But then what do the other two terms have in common? They have nothing in common, right? This one doesn't have any x's, and that one doesn't have any numbers, right? When they have nothing in common, you can always factor out or multiply by a one, right? So we'll factor out a negative one. When I do that, all it's going to do is change that x to a positive and change that three to a negative. Which makes sense because these two should match, right? So then now if I factor what this term and this term have in common, they have an x minus three in common. So I'm left with eight x squared minus one. And then can you factor this guy? It has a square, so I should try. And it does the difference of two squares, right? So you have x minus one and x plus one, or vice versa. It doesn't matter which one right first. And so then to get my key numbers, what are my key numbers? I don't even need to show the next step of me equaling them all to zero. Just as long as I know what I'm going to get when I equal them all to zero. What is going to be the answer from this one equal to zero? And then from the middle factor equal to zero? And then the last factor equal to zero? So there's my key number. So I have done this. I'm in a process of doing that. We'll get there. The whole thing, the whole process is the solving process. Okay, now the test value. So I'm going to write my number line. 
And I've got three of them and they're actually in the backwards order, right? We should go the other way. So negative one here, one there, and then three here. And so I'm gonna pick some test numbers. I have to pick four of them. And all I need to do is just tell me what they are. So what number are you gonna use in this region? Sure, so I'm gonna write negative two. What number are you gonna use in this second region? Yes. And a number in the third region? Two. And a number in the last region? Sure. So just make sure you do that. So now I've done both of those two things. I've identified my key numbers and I've identified my test values. Once you do that, you have to actually show the work. So me, I usually like to put like little dotted lines here just so that I can show my work right underneath the area that I'm testing, right? And so I'm gonna put them into this line here before I got the key numbers. So if I plug in, you don't even need to do the work, you just need to give me the signs. So if I'm plugging in negative two into this first factor, what kind of answer am I going to get in that first bubble, in that first set of parentheses? A positive or a negative? A negative. If I put a negative two into the second parentheses, what do I get? Another negative. And if I put negative two into this last um, parentheses, what do I get? Another negative. And we already know that if there's an odd number of negatives, you end up with a negative. So is a negative number greater than zero? No, so this one is false. You could also do it with the actual numbers. If you do the actual math with the numbers and everything, that is okay. If you figure out that it is what, negative five times negative three, which is positive 15 times negative one, you figure out that this is negative 15, right? That's okay. You can actually figure out the correct number if you want. It's just not necessary. So now we're going to try zero. If I put zero into the first set of parentheses, what do I get when I put zero in here? Positive or negative? And when I put zero into the second factor, and when we put zero into the last factor, positive. So now I have an even number of negatives, so it's going to end up being positive. And is that true or false? Good. Now we do the last one. So two going into here, be negative, two going into the middle one, positive. And then two going into the last factor, positive. So then I have only an odd number of negatives, so that's a negative. And is this true or false? False. Finally, the last one. So when we put four into the first factor, we'll get a positive. When we put four into the second factor, we'll get another positive. And when we put four into the last factor, we'll get positive. So there's no negatives here, which means it will be positive. And that one is true. So we get two sections that work. However, we do need to figure out what our endpoints look like. Because this was a uh, strictly greater, no bar, right? These would all have like open dots, right? Our key numbers would all have open dots. So then if I want to write this as an interval, it's going to be parentheses from negative one to one. And then if I write this as an interval, it's going to be parentheses from the key number three to infinity. You just put a union and you have it there. If they ask you for the graph, you're literally going to have negative one, one, and three. And this part would be shaded going that way. And this part in here would be shaded right. If you get that up there, it's okay too, right? Just as long as I see the shaded graph. Don't just look at this. And then you'll select the answer that has that. Okay, make sure you also shade the graph as well. Okay, so I did show my work on this and I'm completely finished and I've solved it all. Okay. So
So make sure you're doing these three steps. And you need to see this while you're coming up with these conclusions. Because if you get the wrong conclusion, that's like a lot less points than if I see an error and only get minus one point. I had another student complain, say not complain, but just observe the fact that these problems take a whole page. Like, yeah, we could get some little stuff. Take ages to do one problem. And they're like, oh, well, we'll have graphing calculators. I'm like, you can take my class. You won't have a graphing calculator. <laughs> and not all the instructors require graphing calculators. I think they're all on par with the philosophy that you should not have one because of that calculator. They don't know how to graph by the time you get there. We'll not be able to do a whole entire chapter. Okay. Um, so I'm going to write this one. It's another one. Notice all three of these problems are the same thing. Four problems, actually. Four problems that are the same process. They're all polynomials, inequalities, right? So we're going to completely do that same process. I'm going to be able to go through it a little bit faster now that we've done one, right? So here, it's only two terms. When it's only two terms, all you can do is see if it has GCF and then see if maybe it's different to square the difference between some of you think of that. So these guys do have an x squared in common. And when I take that x squared out, I factor it out, I end up with this. And this guy cannot be factored anymore. And that, there's really no point to factor that, right? I mean, I could put x times x, but that doesn't do nothing, right? So this is good. So then what are going to be my key numbers? Can you go from here and just tell me the key numbers or do you have to actually break down this equals zero, that equals zero, solve zero? Key number zero or zero or zero. The faster you can do that, the better, right? Save time and space. So yes, if I set this one equal to zero, I'm basically taking the square root of zero, I have zero. If I set this one equal to zero, I have to add the three over, which makes it positive, but then I have to divide by this two. Right. So we get that three now I'm going to draw a number line. Zero would be here, and a positive number would be to the right of it. And let's pick our test values. So, what test value can we choose in this first region? Sure. And what number can we test in this region? We can test one because this is one and a half. Right? So one is going to be over here. Good. And then what about the last region? Four. Now you could also just do this, right? Instead of labeling them, just identify them. Didn't I identify them? Right? Okay. Now I like to put the little dotted lines just to keep my stuff, you know, in line. You don't have to write the line, but. You do have to actually show the work here. So what happens if I plug in a number into a square? Regardless of what kind of number it is, what do I get when I square something? A positive or a negative? Always a positive, right? Because when you square negatives, the double negative makes a positive. So I know for sure that I'm going to have a positive in the front factor for all of them. I know that for sure because of the square. However, for in here, if I plug a negative two in there, what kind of number would I get? Positive or negative? Would be a negative, because that would make a negative four and then negative three is bigger than negative, right? Make a negative seven. I don't care about the seven, just the sign. What happens when you plug in one into this factor? Do you get a positive or a negative? You do, because you get positive two minus three which is a negative one. And then what about when you plug in four? Now you have eight minus three, which is a positive one. So when I do this product, I'll get a negative. When I do this product, I'll get a negative. And when I do this product, I'll get a positive, right? Is this one true or false? True. true. Is this one true or false? And then is the last one true or false? False. 
And so then basically I need to shade this side over here, shade in the middle. I just need to decide what goes on these ends. The inequality does not have a bar in it. So then these should have parentheses. Now here though, you have one parentheses for this section, but then you have another parentheses over there for this section. So you have two, right? Two sections here. So you do negative infinity to zero and then zero to three halves. Can you put these together and just go from negative infinity all the way to three halves? You cannot. Why though? Right. In order for you to do that, this zero would have to be included, right? And because it's parentheses, the zeros are not included, okay? But if they were brackets, yes, you would be able to go negative infinity to three halves. So keep that in mind because it may happen. I know it happened to us in one of the ones we're doing in class, right? So it could happen. So see what the other one is gonna do. And I did everything that I the directions will tell you. I identified my key numbers, I identified my test values, I showed you what I was doing for all the test values, and then I gave you my conclusion. And I even have the graph right there. So everything that could possibly be wanted is already there. This problem is nice. I promise we'll get one like this. I remember. I remember there being one. I just don't know remember if I removed it or not. Because <laughs> there were 16 problems on the test, and then I needed to turn it to 10. It took me too much time. Do those 16. So I was like, I need to lesson it so that you guys will have time to do it. Okay. What's cool about this one is it's already all nice and factored for me, isn't it? So I could just tell you the key numbers right now. What would they be? One and negative three. And so then if I break up my number line, negative three is actually on the left and one is on the right. Okay, um, and then what test number may check in this area here? Sure, what about in between these guys? Yeah, between negative and positive, I always pick zero. And then somebody over here, well, sure. So then I'm just gonna put a little arrow and say those are my test values. Even if you don't write the word, I would accept it as long as you have them identified, right? Like they're there. Because I'll get a lot of people who say these are the key numbers and then just go select the answer. And it's like, no. <laughs> How do you know that that's the answer from just getting the key numbers? You can't, right? You have to do some stuff. So let's test. I'm going to plug them in there. So when I plug in, an, oh, does it matter what I get if I have a square? It doesn't matter. I know that this factor is always going to be positive. I just need to figure out the other factor. Because that one, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen unless it's positive or negative. Because when you cube something, if this is positive, then when you cube it, it'll be positive. But if this is negative, when you cube it, it'll also be negative. Okay. So I really need to figure out what sign will be inside the parentheses. And then I'll know what sign to put in here. So if you plug in a negative five into that factor, what sign will you get? You'll get a negative two. And when I cube it, it will stay a negative. Now what happens when I plug in zero? Do I get a positive or a negative? I get positive. And when I cube that positive, it'll still be positive. And finally, the five, when I plug that in there, will we get? Positive or negative? Positive. So when I do this product, I'll get negative. When I do this product, I'll get positive. When I do this product, I'll get positive. So is this one true? No. Are the others true? Yes. Yes. So then I would be scribbling in this section and this section. And then according to the inequality, it does have bars. So I should have a bracket going this way for that section and then a bracket going this way for this section, right? 
Now for this one, can I go from negative three all the way to infinity? You can because it does include that one in the middle, right? So we're gonna go from negative three all the way to infinity here. And then I always ask you to box your answer just so that I can see like what your conclusion was. I'm just gonna box that right there. Okay, I think we have one more like this and then we'll get into a different kind of problem, okay? So we've got that one. Again, this one is also super nice because it is factored already. So what are the key numbers here? If you set x to the fourth equal to zero, what do you get? Zero. And then if you set x minus nine equal to zero, what do you get? Positive. Positive. So I'm going to draw a little number line. Zero goes here, nine goes there. And then what number do you want to test in this left region? Sure. What number do you want to test in the middle? And what number do you want to test on the right? So let's, I like to do this. It also helps me like remember where the key numbers are, right? When I draw little barriers. So regardless of what I plug in, what happens when you have an x to the fourth power? It will be positive. As long as that exponent is even, it doesn't matter whether this is a positive number or whether this is a negative number. It will come out positive. So I know what the first factor is going to look like for all of them. I don't even need to go plug them in. But the second factor only has an exponent of one. That's odd. So I do have to check that. So when I plug in negative 10, what sign do I get? When I plug in a five in the second factor, what sign do I get? I want to plug in positive 10 to that second factor, what sign do I get? Positive. So then this product will turn out negative, this product will turn out negative, this product will turn out positive. I keep saying product, what does product mean? Multiplication, yes. So is this one true or false? So then both of these are true. Because they're the same, right? And then that guy has to be false. So I'm going to have this side shaded, this side shaded. And what kind of symbols go on the zero and the nine? Parentheses or brackets? Right. How do we know brackets? Right, that little bar right there, right? So then that means I'm gonna have a bracket for this region, but then I'm gonna have another bracket going the other way for that region. Can I combine this into one interval? Does have brackets on zero, so I can. So when you're doing it on the test, you're not gonna see this double bracket right there, okay? I had it because that's how I decided, right? But you won't see this at all. It'll just be like shaded all the way over. I just want to point out, you won't see that double bracket. Now, if there's parentheses, you will see the double bracket. You folks have to say that. Okay, I think in number five, it gets a little bit different. So we're going to switch over to the next chapter. So this one's asking us about domain. This one is super important, so I'm pretty sure uh, that's a domain problem in there. Um, x squared minus 8x minus 12 x squared plus 7x. So it says all real numbers x such that x cannot equal something or another. Okay. How do I figure that out when you're having a fraction in one of those domains? What is the only restriction you have for fractions? Right, your denominator cannot equal zero, can it? So when I take this and I set this denominator, the 
equal to zero or not equal to zero, I'd have to factor it. You cannot factor it in the quadratic formula to get the two numbers. I can factor this, I am going to. Five times two is 10, and five plus two is seven. So I get X cannot equal what and what? This is what you wanted. Okay. Now, if somebody starts messing around with that numerator, that's a big clue to me you have no idea what you're doing, right? So make sure that you're showing those proper steps. Okay. So I'm going to look for it's the middle one. That was actually point, right? Okay, number six is just simplifying a fraction. Now, I think the instructions, this is kind of not a great, um, I'm going to do it like the way it is on the test, just so I think I'll have an example, okay? But on the test, it's multiple choice. And we already mentioned in the lesson that whenever you cancel a factor, we notice that the book was putting like, well, X cannot equal this or that because based on the factor that you cancel, right? So, those parts of the statement, like they'll have the answer, they'll have the fraction, whatever the answer is, but then they'll say like X cannot equal a certain number next to it. And in the direction, it says, show your work for all parts of the answer, okay? So not only do you need to show me your work on how you get the fraction, you also need to explain on where this number came from, okay? So make sure you're showing your work for both of those parts. And I'm going to do that while I do these problems, okay? So you can see what I mean, what I'm expecting, okay? So for this one, could I reduce this by any What number could I reduce by? Okay, so let me make sure. I think 56 can be divided by 8. Yes. Yeah, it can. And 40 divided by 8 is 5. So I can reduce this by eight. If I reduce this by eight, let me write it this way instead. I'm gonna write this eight times, what I say seven. And then I'm gonna write X squared times what? How do you get X cubed? X squared times what? X. And at the bottom, I'm gonna write eight times five and then the X squared. And why did I peel this apart using an X squared? Because I saw an X squared downstairs. My, my goal is to cancel it, right? So here the eight will cancel and the x squared will cancel. And right there, as soon as you cancel it, you have to say x squared cannot equal zero. <coughs> and then if I solve that, I actually get x cannot equal what? Just x cannot equal, I have to do square root, right? What's the square root of zero? Correct. Okay, but this is explaining where this part of the answer came from. And when I'm done here, I'm only left with seven times X, which is seven X, and then a five at the bottom. Okay, so this expression is what you'll find in the choices, but then it'll also have another little statement like this next to it. Okay, so make sure you're showing your steps or your work for both of those pieces. Don't just find the answer that has 7x over 5 and be like, okay, I'm done. It's the only one with 7x over 5. You also need to show me where the restriction came from. Okay. Let's do another one because there's plenty. I don't, I think I only put one, one of these, maybe two, I, I can't remember, but I think it's just one of all of these. But all three of them are the same kind of problem, they just all look different. So my advice is always make sure that they're, your terms are in the correct order before you start factoring. So I'm actually gonna put the positive 15y squared in front and then this positive 20y, I'm gonna put it behind. So now they're all in the right order. Right. And then do the top 
terms have anything in common? Five and Y, good. And so then when I factor that out, I'll end up with three and a Y plus four. And at the bottom, do these guys have anything in common? Two, and when I factor that out, I end up with three Y plus four. So then what happens? These two guys are gonna cancel, right? And I'm gonna be left with five Y over two, but this thing right here that I canceled cannot equal zero, which means Y cannot equal what? What do I get when I solve that? Almost. When I move this over, it'll become negative four and then divide by two. So over here, it'll say X cannot equal negative four. But you've shown me how you got that answer and how you got the description. Interesting thing you said. 
I don't do anything for the X plus seven and no because it's already in the denominator, right? But here's what I wanted to mention. I'm gonna go to another page. This can happen. If I factor it and for some reason I end up with something like this. Not that you're gonna make their problem this long, but let's pretend that it okay. Dude, I can see that. Um I ended up factoring it and I got like, these nutty pins will work for me. They're all super brown. The ugliest color right now wants to work. Better than the red. Okay. I don't like this one on my purple, they're so plain. Okay, so we have this one. If this one cancels with that one, you have to talk about the restriction, right? X cannot equal one. That one's straightforward, that would make sense. Now, this one, if I cancel these two, okay, you do not need to write the restriction. And that is because there's already a plus two still down there, okay? And so when you write your answer, the reader already knows that those two cannot equal zero. And so they already know that four and negative two are part of the restrictions, okay? And so when you go to the choices, they're not gonna have X cannot equal four, X cannot equal negative two. They're just gonna have the X cannot equal one, okay? So I wanted to mention that if you do have multiples, remember that rule, only one top can cancel out one bottom, okay? This one guy is not gonna cancel out both of these, okay? And because these match, you don't need to talk about the restriction for that guy because it's already still gonna be there, okay? So I just wanted to mention that you need to have to on the test and you see it and you're not like, well, where's the other two or the negative two? It's not gonna be there, okay? Just in case. I really don't remember which one I did, but I know I saw that when I was doing the test. But I took it before I started editing. Editing. I cannot do that one. Before I started messing with it. <laughs> okay. Do I need to rearrange anybody here before I start factoring away? I do. I have to rearrange this guy right here. He's not in the right order. It needs to be negative x plus three. Another thing that I need to do before I start factoring is use the rule for division. You're supposed to keep the first fraction exactly as it was, change this to multiply, and then flip the other fraction over. That's the only way we can divide fractions. Uh, it's not KFC, but it's almost like that it's K. Okay. No, it's exchange. So it's KCF. Right? You keep the first fraction exactly as it was, you change the division to times, and then you flip the second fraction. I always called it keep change flip when I was teaching at the very, very beginning. Okay, now let's try to factor this guy. And the other guy. So for here, we can do the difference of squares. For here, we can factor out a three. For here, there's a three up there, isn't there? So I probably want to break this apart as three times something else. Three times what equals nine? Then this guy has that negative on the front, so I have no choice. I have to factor out a negative one. And when I do that, the x will become positive and the three will become negative. Right? If I distribute that back, do I get negative and positive? I did factor it good. And now it's a matter of canceling the weight. So brown was the best option I have here that was visible. So we're going to do the x minus three is going to cancel that. And you even have a three. Can the three ever equal zero? Well, I don't have to do that for the restriction, right? That one, they're just numbers. 
But when I cancel variables, I do have to say that that cancel factor cannot be zero. So what am I left with? I'm left with x plus three in two of them. So I could put a square and then I'm left with a negative three downstairs because three times negative one is a negative three. And you may not see it like that in the choices though. In the choices, I might have the negative in the front. But these two answers are equivalent. And then of course, for the restriction, x cannot equal three. Okay, so now we're going to get moving. Uh, I think you do have, I don't know whether it's multiplication or division. So I'm glad that the division is in the test because not only do you get to see what happens on how you work division, but are we actually doing the multiplication problem? We also have an example of multiplication problem also, right? Okay, the other ones, these guys are all add and subtract, or these two are anyway. So we definitely need to talk about those, but I did the right one first. We know the little trick for adding and subtracting. What did I call it the last time? KP rules, yeah. I don't know why that keeps getting confused, but it was good. Okay, let's go here. Okay, so we have this and we are going to apply that TP rule. So it's like, let me use the red because it's kind of like located. But we're doing this kind of thing, right? The multiplication. So the X times the X minus one, and then minus, and then the six times the X plus two, all over these two guys together. X plus two and X minus one. So then if I foil, I get, or not FOIL, distribute, I get x minus x, x squared minus x. And then this is a negative 6 that gets distributed. So it'll become negative 6x and negative 12. Do not FOIL at the bottom because we don't know if we're going to have to factor again, right, to reduce it. So just leave the bottom factor. Now I will have negative 7x minus 12. And normally you would try to factor this, but I don't think it can. Because 1, 2, 3, 4. Four is already on the list, so I can stop at 3. Um, none of these will subtract to give me 7, right? I'm going to subtract them. None of them will give me 7. And I do have to subtract because one of them is going to be a positive and one of them is going to be a negative. Right? So it just doesn't factor. So this is your answer there. And you don't have any restrictions on this one because I didn't factor any but I mean, I didn't cancel any factors. So let's look at another one because I think the next one is very similar. It's just there's three fractions. Oh yeah, so negative two over x plus one over x squared plus one plus negative two over x plus x. So the strategy here was to really use our order of operations and just add what's from left to right, okay? So we have to add these two first and then whatever we get, we'll add this other guy later. So let's do that TP rule thing again. So it will be negative two times x squared plus one plus one times x all over x times x squared plus one. And you can put the x in parentheses if you want to, but normally when it's a, what they call monomial, which is one term, you don't have to put the parentheses. So let's distribute that negative two and multiply that. And then I think what I want to do is rearrange that. Positive X in the middle and then minus two over here. 
However, do I need to do the TP rule again? No, because this factor doesn't. And when I factor out that X, don't I get the exact same denominator as the other one? Right? And the whole point of having doing the, the TP rule was so that we could have a common denominator, right? But these already have a common denominator. So I just need to write this numerator and then plus this numerator. All over the same denominator since they already have the same denominator. And if I combine those negative twos together, I actually get negative four. Now I could try to factor it, but do all of these have an X? No, so I can't factor out an X, right? Which means that guy's not gonna reduce. And I promise you, if you do factor this, you're not gonna have an X squared inside the parentheses, right? You're gonna have an X and an X to get X squared, aren't you? So no matter how you factor this, you're not gonna get this factor and be able to reduce it, okay? So if you know now you're not gonna be able to reduce it, then don't worry about it, just leave it alone. Don't bother trying to factor it. I don't think these can be factored anyway, because if I multiply these as eight, and there's nothing from eight that will give me one. Number eleven, so number twelve. I'm fit there, but we'll see. Oh yeah, it's not too bad. Okay, so we have parentheses x squared minus one over x. And at the bottom, we have brackets x plus, so x minus 1 squared over x. Okay. So we've got this one here. Looking at the two denominators, don't they already have a common denominator? So I already know what the common denominator is, it's X. And so what you do is you multiply by X over X. And what does that do? It cancels this guy. It's not what you can look around. There it is. So you cancel the drag out. We'll cancel this one with the other one. Let me go by the pins, they're like not working. <laughs> it's this one with that one. So what are we left with? We are left with the x squared minus one from numerator and the x minus one squared from the denominator. Can you factor this numerator? And then will this fraction reduce? I'm going to cancel out an x minus one, but there's two down there, right? So when there's two, you can only keep, take out one of these with one of these. Okay. So you'll still be left with an x minus one downstairs. Now, remember, we talked about that, right? It's not going to have a restriction because you still have one of those same kind of factors at the bottom, right? If that were not double and one was an x minus one and the other one was something else, and I factored the x, canceled the x minus one, I would have to say x is not equal one. Okay. But the fact that it's still down there, we can tell that x cannot equal one. Okay. So leave it alone, it's not going to have any restrictions on it. Okay, 13, let's see what that one looks like. I want to get through all of them before class time. We'll have another 45 minutes or so, so we should be good. Okay, so for this one, we have these two factors. Are those the same factors at the bottom? Are these the common denominators? 
they're not common denominators. And when they're not common already, I already know that in order for me to solve an equation, I have to multiply every single term by the common denominator. What is the common denominator here if they don't have one already? Do you remember what we do? Right, just multiply them together. So this will be the common denominator. And that's what I'm going to put here, here, and here. Okay. Now you can be lazy and actually write them right here, like slanted so that they fit, right? Or you can just totally rewrite a whole other line, which is not going to do just to be neat. So if somebody tries to go back and read this, they can. And then my minus 18. I want so every single factor, every single term multiplied by this LCD. And so then let's see. For the first term, the x plus 5 will cancel. For the second term, the x plus 15 will cancel. And then for the third term, there's no denominator. So nothing will cancel over here. So we end up with 39 and this minus 18 and x plus 5 equal to, well, if I multiply by 1, just x plus 5 and x minus plus 15. Okay. I did cancel some stuff, didn't I? So I actually am going to have some restrictions. x cannot equal what? What do you get from this guy when you said it equals 0? Negative 5. What do you get when you said this guy equals 0? Negative 15. And this is important too. Not only just out of habit, right? If you cancel something, make sure you put the restriction. But it's also important because what if I do all this math and I get negative 5 as one of my answers? We already know x cannot be negative 5, so don't go some x to negative 5, right? Or if I got negative 15 as my answer, you cannot select the answer that has negative 15. You might get all your math right if you got negative 15. X cannot equal negative 15, right? It's going to make that denominator undefined, okay? So it is good to have those restrictions there. So let's go finish with our math. Oh gosh, 39 times 15. Big number is 28. Do you get a big number? Don't freak out and start thinking you did something wrong. Just keep working it out. It can be fix itself. So if I combine my like terms, I get 21x plus 495. And so I've done as much as I can do as far as like simplifying it. Once you're done with all that simplifying though, you really need to look at it. And if it's a quadratic, you can solve it as a quadratic. If there's no x squared, then just solve it as linear, right? But mine is an x squared, which means I have to get equal to zero. And right now he's positive over there, right? So I want to keep him there and move these two guys. So I'm going to put this under the appropriate terms. So those two are out. Now I have negative x minus 420. Gosh, what are the Let me take the square root of 420 because I feel like they need to be real close to each other in order for me to get negative one, right? So let's see, 420 square root is small, it's 20 point something. So 420 be divided by 21. Ah, I can't. 20 21. That's perfect, right? So then let's see. And if you can't factor it, what's the other option? Like if you just see that number, you're like, uh, no. <laughs> Sorry to happen today. What's the other alternative to do besides factoring it? Quadratic formula. And you'll get the same two answers. Okay. So I got 20 and 21, and the middle guy needs to be the bigger number sign. 
So then this one has to be positive to give me a negative 420. So then if I set each one equal to zero, I'm gonna get X equals what? And positive And are those any of the restrictions that we have? No. So then both of these are good solutions. Just need to double check the restrictions you have. Which is really the same thing as checking the denominators that I mentioned in my lesson, right? I said once you get your answers, just check with the denominators. You don't have to check the whole problem. Just need to make sure that these guys don't make these bottoms zero. You already know what's going to make the bottom zero. Okay, I think we have another one of these. You only have one equation on the test. But I think there's a few in here just so that you practice because you really don't know what the equations are going to look like. So it's better to have practice with a few of them just so that you can kind of work them. Now here, do these have a common denominator as they are? This one doesn't have one, but between these two. These are not the same, are they? When we talked about it, if they're not the same, what do you do? So for my LCD, I'm just going to multiply them together. X times X squared is going to actually give me X cubed, isn't it? So in that tiny side, I'm going to cheat, not cheat, but lazy. <laughs> and just write times x cubed, times x cubed, times x cubed, times x cubed. I mentioned we could do that in the last problem, but I didn't. I wrote it all out, right? So here, nothing is going to cancel, right, for this first term. So we're just going to have 5x cubed. But here, there will be some canceling. This x will cancel out one of these, but it'll still have two left over on one x. So it'll be minus 9x squared. And then here, I can cancel out two of them, but I'll still be left with one of them. So I will have minus 2 and an x. And what is 0 times anything? Still just 0. And I cannot simplify that anymore, so now I just need to look at it and decide what kind of equation this is. It looks like it's a polynomial equation, which we have not really gotten into how to solve polynomial equations, but this is not so bad because we do have an x in common, right? So if you take that out, then you're really not dealing with a cubic function anymore. You're only dealing with 5x squared minus 9x minus 2. And I believe this can be factored. If you cannot factor it, don't bother. Um, 2 and a 1. So that's going to be negative. That's going to be positive. Again, if you cannot factor this, then don't do that. From here, say this guy will equal zero, which gives you one answer, right? And then say this guy will equal zero and do the quadratic form. Okay. I actually can factor that, so I went ahead and did it. Okay. And then I just need to set each factor equal to zero. I forgot something though. Didn't we cancel? We canceled x's, right? So what happens when you set those x's not equal to zero? You get x cannot equal zero. Even if I were to take x squared not equal to zero, then I still get x cannot equal zero. Okay. So when we come down here, we have to set this guy equal to zero, this guy equal to zero, which gives me negative one fifth. Right? Move over the negative one, and then I divide by five. And here, x will equal a positive 2. Are any of these bad? Right, you just said x cannot equal 0, right? And if I try to put that 0 up in here, doesn't it make it undefined? Okay, so this one is no good. The only two actual answers are these two. And if you have that statement right there, I know why you x out this one, right? Even if you just say, put a line right here, x cannot equal zero. I know why you didn't put that as your answer. There's one more equation. Yes, sir. 
Some more equation and then word problems. So we do have a word problem on the test. Uh, the word problem may not be exactly like these problems. We're going to do these two problems, but it may not be exactly like these two. Maybe something else you have to think through. Okay, these are not the same denominators, right? And so if I don't have the same denominator, we're just going to multiply them together. Whether I write LCD or just DD doesn't matter. Seven times X plus two. And since this is pretty short, I think I'm going to shortcut here by writing. And just do it in slant. So that on the first factor, just the seven cancels. So I'm really left with the whole numerator times the X plus two. Minus sign. And here's the x plus 2 to cancel, which automatically tells me x cannot equal what? Negative 2. But I'll still have that 7. I like to write the monomials in the front and then the binomial on the back. So I just put the 7 in the front, but there was a minus sign there. Right? And what is 0 times anything, no matter how complicated it is? So it's just 0. So if I foil this out, and I distribute this one out, I have these terms, and we'll combine our like terms. So we have, oh wow, all the x's go away, don't they? Right, I have seven, positive seven, and then a minus seven. So these will go to each other. Out. And then 10 and negative 35 is negative. There's two ways to go from here. You can either factor or you can do the extraction of roots, right? It doesn't matter which one you do. Which one you want to do. Basically, you either have to factor it like this or you have to add the 25 over here, right? And then when you take the square root, what do you get? X equals plus or minus. Five, right? And if you're doing this one, you get x equal to negative five from that factor and positive five from that factor. So don't you get the same method? Okay. It's just which method did you choose to go okay. I don't care. As long as you have five and negative five, we're good. Are any of these answers are any of these answers bad? No, they're not negative two, right? So they're both good. That's what you do my you make the choices like this, so keep that in mind. It might not be separated. You could also be removed with plus or minus. Okay. I can't remember what the choices are, like, but it could be either or. Okay. Let's see, 16 is the whole word problem. So I'm going to leave this up here and I'm only going to write down the numbers. Okay. Um, it says working together, two people can complete a task in six hours. So that means their time that they take together is going to be six hours. So that first sentence, I translated into an equation. The time together is six hours. That's that first equation in a, the first sentence in equation form. Now the second sentence says, working alone, one person takes four hours longer than the others to complete the task. So that means if I've got the time of the first person and the time of the second person, we can let one of them, doesn't matter which one, one of them be X. But if the other guy is supposed to take four hours longer, then this other guy would be what? Plus one. So his time and then four more hours, right? 
And then it says, how long would it take for each person to complete the task? And then the slower person and the faster person, okay? So we need to know the big formula here. And if this is one of the problems that you get on the test, you have to know this formula. It's one over time one plus one over time two equals one over time together. So then if you can put that on an index card and then for the test, just look at it real quick and I'll put it with right. And scribble it at the top of the test if you need to. That's called a memory dump. Actual test properties. <laughs> I've done it before too, just like look at all the formulas and then as soon as they gave my test, put the paper away, start scribbling all the formulas like I remember before I began my test. Okay, so let's fill in everybody. Um, T1 is X, T2 is X plus four, and T together is six. So if I don't have common denominators, I'm just gonna multiply everybody together. So I'm gonna end up with it, to write it in its formal form, the number goes in front, then the single x, and then the x plus 4. Right, so it's multiplying all three of these together and then just writing them nice and neat. So let's go put that on every fraction. So let's cancel this x, we'll cancel with that x, this x plus 4, we'll cancel with that x plus 4, and this 6, we'll cancel with that 6. And already I have two restrictions. This guy cannot equal 0, and this guy cannot equal 0. And so there are much restrictions, right? So let's see what we'll get. Um, 1 times 6 is 6. We still need to multiply x plus 4. 1 times 6x is just 6x, with nothing else there. And then 1 times x is x, but I still have to multiply the x plus 4. So let's distribute. And I do have a square going. I can combine what terms first, but I do still have a square. So yeah, I'm gonna have to move everybody over there to the square. So these go away, I have zero, and then I have x squared minus eight x minus 24. And that can be factored. Sense for this to be the answer? No, because we're talking about time, right? 
but don't go back in time. So that means x has to be 10.3 hours. So then what would x plus 4 be? 14.3 hours. So who's the faster person here? Uh -huh. So this one's the faster and this one's the slower. So make sure you do know which one's which because on the computer it is asking you to plug them in the correct spots, okay? So for the slower one, I'd be typing in the 14.3 and then for the faster one, I'd be typing in that 10.3. Getting there, we're getting there. We have like what? One more, and 17, 19, 20. One more. So, this one again, I'm not going to write it all down yet. I'm just going to write out information. It says the family drives 1764 miles. So, that means my distance is 1764 miles. So the first sentence, I literally just wrote the distance. Then the next part says, on the return trip, the family takes three and a half hours longer. So I drove over there, it took me that long. On the way back, it took me this much longer. So I'm going to say original rate or speed, same thing is x i don't know what that is but the return rate or speed we're going faster or slower it took me that much longer oh, i'm talking about time not speed three and a half hours longer okay i'm gonna stop right there so i'm gonna say original time was took me t number of hours right the return time should be t plus 3.5 right three and a half hours longer let's see what the rest of it says traveling at an average speed of seven miles per hour slower ah so we did have original speed who knows what that is? I'm going to use an S. And then we have return speed. And that would be S. Oh, I'm going slower though. So it'd be S minus seven, right? Is that right? The fact that I'm going slower on the return trip. And then it says it did drive the same exact distance, right? So that number is actually extra information, to be honest. I don't even need this. I know they travel the same distance, right? So the, uh, the distance to rate A is going to equal the distance returning from rate A, right? And we have a formula for distance. Distance, we know, is equal to rate times time. Is, is the return speed on S plus seven? The return, they returned and they were driving seven slower. miles slower. So that means that however fast I'm going, it's going to be a smaller number than however fast I was going when I went over there. Does that make sense? Okay, so for this, Distance to the spot would be these numbers here on the top. So it would be my rate is this S that I'm using, and my time is this T. My distance returning is going to be my rate, which is S minus 7 and T plus 3.5. There is an issue here, though. We have too many variables. Oh, I know what I can do. I can rewrite one of these. I can take the fact that my distance is 1764 and the original rate was S and the original time was T, right? 
right? I can take this equation and solve for one of the variables. Which one do you want? Which one do you want to stay here on this side? Does not matter at all. Do you want to keep S over here? Or do you want to keep T in here? Yes. Okay. So then, in order to get the S by itself, I'm going to have to divide by T, right? So I get 1764 over T. Now I have an expression to use instead of S. So over here, my big equation that I'm trying to solve, I don't need to use S's. I can use 1764 over T instead of the S's. Now on this side, the T's are gonna cancel, right? So I do have a restriction that T cannot equal zero because that does cancel. And over here, I have to distribute. So when I multiply these guys, the T is gonna cancel again. And when I multiply these guys, I'm gonna get something over T, but I don't know. 1764 times 3.5. This number. Then now these guys, I get negative 17, and these guys, I get negative 7.5345. Okay, this is great, but I have a fraction going. Okay. So I need to multiply everybody by the common denominator, which is t. This guy times t, this guy times t, this guy times t, this one times t, and finally the last one times t. These are going to cancel, but we already have the restriction, right? So we don't need to do it again because it's the same variable, the same number. We get 1764t, 1764t, 6174, no more t's here. 70 squared and 24.5 t. I'm definitely going to be using quadratic formula for this one, especially that decimal in there. So I can minus this and get it equal to zero. And since I'm going to use the quadratic formula, I really don't care if t squared is negative or positive. But I am going to write this in order. So the negative seven t squared first, the negative 24.5 t next, and then the positive 6174 last. And I'm gonna do the quadratic form because I'm not gonna to try to sit here and back this, especially with decimal. So t will equal negative b plus or minus square root plus b squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. That will turn positive and I'll know what I get. Let's see. Here parentheses negative twenty four point five squared minus four times negative seven times six point seven four. Get this ugly number. That's okay, so I'm just going to put it in my calculator anyway, right? So I'm going to do one with the plus and one with the minus. So fraction 24.5 plus the square root of that thing. All over negative 14. And I'm going to go to the side with the double arrow so it gives me the test. And it gives me negative 63 over 2. I would have never gotten that track factor. Now I'm going to do the other one, but with the minus. Minus 9. And we get 2 minus. So we are talking about t, right, which is time. Does it make sense for the time to be negative? No. 
So I do know that the time is going to take 28 um, hours, I think is what it was, the time. 28 hours um, going, right? Not returning. Because look up here, my original time going was T. Returning was what? T plus 3.5, right? What is 28 plus 3.5? 31.5 hours return. But is that what they're asking for? That's so like that. It says determine the average speed on the way to the lodge. So it is not asking me about my time. But it does want to know what's happening on the way, right? So it doesn't care about its return at all. How can I use this information about going? to figure out how fast I move. You pull the paper down so you can keep moving that up there. A little bit further. Don't you have, it tells you the speed is this, right? So I can use that formula to figure out the speed. And we already know that S by itself is the speed going over there, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that 28 that I found, and I'm gonna say 1764 over 28 should equal my speed. Oh, that's a nice number, but let's see. It is 63. So then that means I was going 63 miles per hour going to the vacation. And returning since I was going slower, probably be like what 56 miles per hour. I don't think this problem on the test, but I can't say for sure. Don't quote me on here. Nope. It could just be that I have a bad memory. <laughs> But I don't remember doing that, I swear. Okay. Um, okay, we're down to the last three. Now, all the last three are the same. Um, the same kind of topic. So you're only going to get one of all these three. Okay. But we don't know which one it's going to look like or which one it's going to look like the most. But they're not all exactly the same. Okay. So we're going to go through the process and remember the directions on these. You have to tell me the key numbers and your test values and show your steps for the testing. Okay. So it is an inequality, and you do already have one fraction and a zero, right? With this fraction one, you had to have it like that. You had to have a fraction, a symbol, and a zero. There's no other way to do those problems. Okay, they have to be in that form, but it is, right? And so you're going to take your numerator and equal it to zero. And then you're going to take your denominator. And I'm actually going to say the denominator can actually not equal zero, right? We still need to find a key number that goes with it. So my numerator is going to give me plus or minus seven. And my denominator, I'm going to get zero, but I just know that I can't equal. So my key numbers are going to be seven, negative seven, and zero. So I'm going to draw my number line. Negative seven here, zero in the middle, and positive seven over there. Now we have four sections now we got to test. So if I test in here, what number can I test in here? Sure. How about a number in there? And a number in here. And a number out here. Yes, we'll drop it. So then I'm going to go here. And again, you don't have to pass the same number, right? Anything in that region is good. It'll give you the same conclusion. So let's plug in negative things. All I care about is the sign. So you can use a calculator. I can say negative eight squared 
minus 45 over negative 8. All I care about is that it's negative. Okay. So negative. Is a negative less than zero? Okay, so this is true. Now we'll test negative five. So I can do the same thing, but I'm just going to change my eights to fives. And I get a positive nine. So they get positive. But I'm showing you where that positive came from, aren't I? Okay, that's important. This one is false now. And I'm going to try five. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to copy it and just erase those negatives. That's the good thing about taking symmetric numbers, like I'll keep doing a little 20, I'll keep doing it. So you will keep taking symmetric numbers. So when you put them in, you just basically change the sign. So I ended up with what? A negative, which makes it true again. And then finally, I'll plug in the eight. Let's see, I'm gonna go back up to that again, just change them with the five states. So we get positive. So this one's false. So I get two sections that work, this one and this one. Now, you have to use your inequality to decide what happens to the numerator bits, okay? The numerator key numbers. So this does not have a bar, does it? So that means these guys cannot have bars, okay? So there's gonna be parentheses on this guy going that way and this guy going that way because of where the shape is, right? And on the zero, can the zero have a bar? It literally says it cannot equal it, right? So you have to have a parenthesis. And so there's your graphical answer. And if you want the intervals, it's going to be negative infinity to negative seven, and then zero to positive seven. Oh, I forgot something. What did I not do? The only thing I didn't do was tell you that these guys were my test values. As long as I see them there, I swear that I'll be good. Okay. Because to me, if you've got them written there, then you've identified what the test numbers you're going to use. Right? Okay. And if you've got these guys here too, then I know what your numbers are. Okay, that one, that one. So not too bad, not too bad. We got two more of these kinds of problems. What is the next one? X plus 12 in the top and X plus two in the bottom. Is that free again? It was a whole section. So we've got this. Is this one ready for me to do numerator and denominator? It does not have zero, right? So we have to minus the three over first. And before I can set the numerator denominator, it has to be one giant fraction, right? So we have to do that little TP thing. Just put this guy over one, okay? So I'll get one times this, which is just going to be x plus 12, and then minus three times that denominator all over one times this denominator. So it's just x plus two, right? So then I get x plus 12 minus three x minus six. And then I get negative two x plus six. Okay, now it is a fraction, simple and a zero, right? So now you can take your numerator and equal it to zero and your denominator can never equal zero. So negative two X plus six, and X plus two cannot equal zero. This one I can solve pretty easy. This one, when I move that over, it'll be negative six. And then when I divide by the negative two, what do you get? positive three. So 
So my key numbers are going to be three and negative two. Only two, two key numbers. And then my test values are going to be what over here? And what in here? So and over here. So these guys are my test values. And so then I'm going to test them. Test them in the last equation that you left off on. Okay. So when I plug in a negative three in there, you can just write out and then just use the calculator, right? Like I found the last problem. So let's do clear fraction. Negative two, negative three plus six over negative three plus two. And I get a negative. Is a negative greater than or equal to zero? Then I'm going to plug in zero. So I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to change those negative threes to zeros. And I get positive three. That is true. Positive is greater than zero. And then now we're going to go back and put fours instead of zeros. And I get a negative one. So I forgot to tell you what I'm doing in my calculator. So now that I told you what I was doing in my calculator, I did get a negative three. And so this one's false. Now, that does mean that this section will get shaded. And we know that the number that came from the denominator, it can be equal negative two, right? So we know that one has a parenthesis. But for the three, that came from the numerator. So you have to actually go back to the original inequality symbol. It has a bar, doesn't it? So the fact that it has a bar means this guy should have a bracket. Okay. And so your final answer for this one will be negative two and a bracket for three. Very, very careful with that. Remember, the numerator, you go to the original symbol to decide parentheses or brackets. For the denominator, there'll always be parentheses. Okay. okay, we have one last last one, and then we are done. Again, there's 20 of them on here, but you're only going to have 10. So some of those problems where there's like three or four of them, you'll probably only get one. But if you practice these problems on the review, then you should be able to complete the problem no matter what it looks like. Okay, there it was. And this one is definitely not good to go. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing as before, just subtract this whole thing over. Before it was a three, this time it's a fraction. If this guy were negative, would I be subtracting him over? If it were negative seven, I would actually be adding him over. Okay. And then we do a little T people. Do not multiply your denominators whenever you do the T P rule. So I get negative 3x plus 24. Now I'm actually going to factor out a negative 3. So I get this. So we're going to take our numerator and equal to 0. So can the negative three ever equal zero? No. But when this guy equals zero, you get x equals what? Positive. You're going to add eight over one, right? So you know your denominator cannot equal zero. So these guys 
cannot equal zero, which means X cannot equal positive three. And what else? How would you solve this equal to zero? You have the minus the three over, right? And then you have to divide by the four. So you get negative three fourths. So I got two numbers from the denominator and one from the numerator. So when I draw my symbols here, let's see the negative five is going to go first, then the smaller number, and then the bigger number. So maybe you could just say the number for these guys. What number would you test over here? Negative what? Negative three. Good. And a number in between? Yeah. Yep. A number in here. What? And a number out here. Fine. Take it. So then those are your test values, right? Okay. Let's do a little chop this up. And let's go plug them in. Now we're going to plug them into this. Okay. So here, since it's already all factored, isn't this three always negative? So I'm going to put a negative here. I'll figure out what these other two are in a second. So a negative here. So let's see. So when we plug in negative three in here, what will we get in this top parentheses when we plug in negative three? So we'll get a negative. When we plug negative three down here, when we plug in negative three down here, it's going to be negative 12 plus three, right? Which is a negative nine. How many negatives do we have all here? We have four of them, right? Which is even, so it does turn out to be positive. Now let's plug in zero. If I plug in zero in here, I'm going to have negative eight. If I plug in zero down here, I'm going to have negative three. And if I plug in zero there, I'm going to have a positive three, right? So there's an odd number of negatives now. It's going to be a negative result. Now let's go try four. So if I plug in four, what sign do I end up with here? Positive four in there. What do I get? A negative, a positive four in here, what do I get? And a positive four in here will be 16 plus three, which is positive, right? And that, how many negatives do I have? Two, so that's even, which means it'll end up being positive. Now the nine. If I plug nine in there, what do I end up with? What's nine minus eight? Positive one, right? What about nine minus three? Positive six. And then if I put a plus in there, it can be 36 plus three, which is also another positive. How many negatives do I have here? One. One is odd, so this is gonna be negative. Now, is a positive less than zero? No. So the positives are gonna be your falses, and then the negatives are gonna be your truths, right? So we're going to shade this section in there and this section over here to the right. Now we go back to the what kind of symbols that we put. For the denominators, they have to be parentheses. So for the negative three fourths of the three, it has to be parentheses. You cannot put anything else. For the numerator, you have to go to the original symbol. So the original symbol tells me what do I put around the A breath. And so we'll go this way. And so that's the graph, I have to box it all box it. But the interval would be negative three, four, three, and then bracket eight to infinity. But that's it. Does anybody have any questions? You do get the whole class period. If you're taking a test online, you get an hour, 90 minutes. So if you take the test online, it's 90 minutes. If you do it in class, that would be like an extra 10. Sitting here, but nobody ever takes that a whole class period. They have it if you needed it. <laughs> um, 
But other than that, any other questions? If not, the homework will not shut off until tomorrow at midnight. But again, like I said, I'm going to reset it. But if you're trying to practice so that you can do well on this test, make sure that all your homework and the review is done tonight. Okay. Any questions? questions that are already <laughs> Well, you guys have a good day. Then. And I will see you tomorrow. If you do choose to take the test online, please um, visit me. You can text me and let me know that you're going to be